Well, happy holidays and Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. I have an exciting announcement. Today is the very grand opening of our Apple Valley campus. Here is a picture on the side screens that you can see. I know so many of you have prayed and financially given to this. Thank you so much for doing that. We cannot wait to see what God does there. And to those of you at Apple Valley right now, welcome. We are so excited for you as well. Now, over the past couple of weeks, we've been in a series called Your Red Flag is Showing. The reality is, is that I have some red flags that can creep up in my life. And well, so, so do you. Over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at these red flags, anger, arrogance, discontentment, dishonesty. And well, this week, The red flag I want us to zoom in on to conclude this series is the red flag of bitterness. What's interesting about all of these red flags is they're really, really hard to see and admit in the mirror. Have you ever asked someone to describe themselves in one word and they respond, arrogant, that's me. Like how many, nobody says that, you know, like you've never been asking somebody how they're doing. I go, you don't think I'm really bitter today. How about you? Like nobody, it's hard to say these things out loud, but it's easy to wake up that way any day. I mean, the way we started off this series was us saying that the only way that we can really deal with our red flags is by being honest about them and With today's red flag of bitterness, I think we have to pause this holiday season and really ask ourselves, are we bitter? I don't know if you've ever looked at the definition of bitterness, but it's anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly, resentment. Essentially, it's unresolved anger that remains on a continuum on our soul. When you look at the definition. Would you or I say that there's a little bit of this in us? In case you're uncertain, I'd like us all to take a little bitterness quiz, okay? I want us to look at a few signs that you might be bitter, okay? Are you ready? Okay, you might be bitter if you have imaginary arguments, okay? Like, if you're just arguing with that person, you envision them, and you're just like, man, I'm just, oh, I'm going to just give them a piece of my mind. If you're envisioning yourself going off on people at all times, you could be bitter. It could be a spouse. It could be a neighbor. It could be a teacher, a politician, or just people who annoy you, okay? I think that you and I are the toughest people in the world in our vehicles, in, our, in the shower, And in the imaginary replay conversation we have with ourselves right after a real fight with our spouse, okay? Because that's the moment that we're like, ooh, that would have been a really great comeback. And the next time I see you, is it? But you don't do it. It's just all up here. I mean, some of us, we don't just have imaginary arguments every once in a while. Some of us are kind of going off on all kinds of people in our head all the time. And if that's you... I'm not saying you are, I'm just saying you might be a little bit bitter. You might be bitter if you are easily offended. Key word here, easily. Have you ever been giving somebody a compliment and it just didn't go well? You know what I mean? Hey man, you look good. Have you lost weight? Are you saying I need to lose some? No, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I could have swore what I said felt positive leaving my mouth, okay? I I just, I I, I don't know, maybe maybe I, I miss misinterpreted something. I mean, I asked a friend for their address the other day to send them a Christmas gift, and they replied, you think I'm going to give you my address so you can look up how much I spent on my home on Zillow? No, no, that's actually not what I, are you okay, sir? Are, is, is everything going on? Wait, what's happening at the job? Is it like, cause I don't, I don't think that's a thing, but I, again, I'm not saying if that's you, that you're bitter. I'm just saying if it is, it might be, you could be bitter. If you feel the need to tell someone what they did when somebody gets fired, broken up with, cheated out of a year-end bonus or is owed money, you can be talking about anything. And somehow, some way, it will come back to that thing. Hey, what are you getting the kids for Christmas? Well, you know, my ex-husband never got the kids what they actually wanted. He always wanted to do the secret Santa thing instead of asking the children what they actually wanted. So this year, I decided to, and you're like, 
hey, I ain't even asked for all them details. I just wanted to know what you was getting your kids for Christmas. But for you and for me, when we're bitter, sometimes it just bleeds out. I mean, you think about sports fanatics. Sometimes they're rambling on about players you've never even heard of because they lost their team a championship by missing a field goal or missing a free throw. And you're like, are you okay? And if that's you, man, it, you could be a little bit bitter. You, you, you know you might be struggling with bitterness if you're keeping a record of wrongs. Now, here's the deal. I, I get that some of us can remember how somebody wronged us this past week, maybe over Thanksgiving, maybe even earlier this week. But where we can really start to call it bitterness is when we've got records of the wrongs of other people from middle school and the 90s. <laughs> like when you ask somebody, like, man, when did that happen? You're like, well, you know, I think it was 19, 19, nah, okay, that's, that's a long time ago. And you can remember finite details about it. Now, you might find yourself at a place in life where you're still responding to what they did or, or didn't do. I just... I know so many siblings who haven't spoken to each other in years. I know parents who are estranged from their children and won't see each other over the holidays. I mean, I just think that there's a litany of things that you and I can become bitter about. I mean, sometimes they cheated on you. Sometimes they cheated on someone you love. Maybe they unfollowed you on social media. Maybe they voted differently than you. I just, I just know what can happen for you and for me. Is that we can walk in a room like this and just have this with somebody else. When bitterness is present in your life and in mine, it can give us a flawed and unrealistic perspective on people and the world. I hear this a lot as it pertains to church hurt. Someone has a bad experience at a church. They either feel judged or they find out that someone isn't who they say they are. And then that person is deemed a hypocrite. And before you know it, the whole church is hypocritical and judgmental, to which I would just simply say, the whole church, all Christians, have you met all Christians? I mean, just sometimes we can come to the conclusions about all Christians based off of our experience with two, and I think we have to step back, and I just have to wonder if you're watching or listening today. And there's just something you're holding on to. And if we're honest, it's just been way too long. Today, I, I want you to begin to envision what your life, your relationships, and your faith would look like if you let it go. One of my favorite conversations in Scripture is between Jesus and Peter in the Gospel of Matthew. This is what it says in Matthew 18. It says, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often? Shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? In Jewish culture, it was taught that you should forgive someone at a maximum of three times. Three strikes and you're out. You get it. That was the name of the game. That's how it works. And that makes sense. Because if you and I, oh, let's just say, we all just say let's just vote on what the numbers should be. One could argue that three is generous. I think most of us would be like, give him two shots. After that, he's done. Like, that would be the consensus. So a rabbi would, would have taught, hey, threes, threes, pretty good. But Peter, he knew that. I can almost see him conferring with the other disciples. Hey, guys, I got a good idea. I got a good idea. I got a good one. This one's going to be really good. When it comes to forgiving other people, most rabbis say three is enough. But guys, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. This is, this is Jesus. I mean, this is the son of God. He has to be at least two times the normal requirement plus one. Guys, I got this. Hey, Jesus, how many times should I forgive a brother or a sister who sins against me? You see this, guys? 
seven times? I mean, I can see him saying it with a smile on his face like he's getting extra brownie points with Jesus. But it's interesting how Jesus responds. Jesus says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. The disciples are looking at Peter like, you in trouble now. <laughs> 70 times seven, that's a lot more than seven. To be exact, we're talking about 490 times. It is an exact number that Jesus gave. But my personal issue with the number is while we may keep a record of wrong, our records aren't that good. Like, when we say a record of wrongs, we're not talking about a literal spreadsheet. Just imagine getting in a fight with somebody you love, and you start saying, listen here, this is your 364th strike. You got 126 more to go, and we're done. You understand me? Nobody is doing that kind of math. <laughs> to which we go, Jesus, <laughs> I mean, who's doing that math? Like, Jesus, eventually... If we tried to keep that record of wrongs, we would eventually lose count. To which Jesus would go, exactly. Why don't you stop counting? That's the point. And Jesus goes on to share a story where he wants Peter to really understand how the kingdom of God really works. And so he goes on to tell a story about a king who decided to square accounts with his servants and and as he went under, underway with that, one servant was brought before him who had run up a debt of what would be the uh, modern-day equivalent of about $100,000. And he couldn't pay up. So Jesus tells us that the, in the story that the king ordered the man along with his wife, children, and goods to be auctioned off at the slave market. The story is harsh on purpose. Now, in this story... Jesus says the poor guy throws himself at the king's feet and begs, come on, man, give me a chance. Come on, I'll, I'll pay it back. Touched by his plea, this king lets him off the hook, erasing his debt. Now, here's what Matthew 18 goes on to say. It says, but when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. You ever choke somebody over a Venmo transaction? This is serious, people. And then he says, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Amazing that servants can throw other servants in prison here. Citizens arrest. It's amazing. And so we see this next. It says, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to do so. So shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you. Here's the deal. Whether you are a Christian or not, here's what I know about you and here's what I know about me. I know not one of us wants to be bitter. I don't know anyone who thinks bitterness is a good life plan. I don't know anybody who's thinking that way today. But we can end up there on accident. But what I believe we find in Scripture is the way to let some things Go. The first thing that I think is important to understand if we want to let go of bitterness and walk in forgiveness is, is this, and it's number one, we, we have to recognize our own need to be forgiven. We have to recognize our own need to be forgiven sometimes in the process of our own bitterness. We can forget that it is plausible that someone else is bitter with us for very legit reasons. It's like we want others to let us off the hook and hold everyone else to the letter of the law. When you get pulled over, what do you want to happen? A warning? Hey, slow down, okay? Keep it moving. We want grace. But let a Ferrari cut you off on the highway. You're praying they get pulled over and have to pay a hefty fine, okay? 
You're wishing the worst on them, but you want amazing grace for you. In the story Jesus tells in Matthew 18, he's trying to explain forgiveness to Peter by saying there's this servant who owed money. A debt was owed, and the owner had all the rights to demand that money back. But the servant asked for forgiveness and received it. As mad as I want to be at some people, as much bitterness as I often would want to hold on some other people, I, this is what I know to be true. I would hate for somebody to do that to me. I, I would hate for God to do that to me. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Rome. He says, for a while we were still weak. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, he died for us? Well, that's good news. Because we could believe that after we went to church, and read our Bibles, and prayed a little bit, and volunteered a little bit, that then, of course, he died for me. <laughs> I mean, right now, come on, let's do it. That's not how it worked. No, while we were making the worst decisions we've ever made in our life, Christ died for us. Thank God for Jesus. I think that we should be thanking God for Jesus. At all times, because I believe it helps us remember that we are not the things that we've done. We are what Christ has done for us. He got for you and he got for me what we could never get on our own, and that is forgiveness from God. If you want to know how to let go of bitterness, I don't know how you do it without the forgiveness of God. I think Jesus is a genius in what he said in verse 33. He's going, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Which leads us to the second thing I want to encourage you to do this weekend. Number two is extend the same grace that has been extended to you. I'm only encouraging you to give grace not because it's a nice thing to do. I'm encouraging you to give grace because it was given to you. The strength to forgive others is found in the reality that we were forgiven. Here's what I believe with all of my heart. Forgiven people have a responsibility to forgive. I'm not naturally a forgiving person. I was supernaturally a forgiven person. I got something I didn't deserve, so I give away what I think other people don't deserve. I think we should forgive the people in our life who hurt us, not because they deserve it, but because I did not deserve it. I love what Matthew 5, verse 23 says. It says, this is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you. Abandon your offering. Leave immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. In this passage, it's like Jesus is speaking to a group of people who think they'll impress God by what they do in church. Jesus is going... Hey, the real indication of your relationship with God is not what you do inside the four walls of a church, but how you treat others outside the four walls of a church. I, I've discovered that a lot of people want to be like Jesus to an extent. We all would love to walk on water. That'd be cool, right? Water to wine, anybody? I'm sure there's a few takers on that. Multiplying food, nice party trick, I presume. Forgive someone 490 times. Now wait just a minute, Jesus. I don't know about all this Jesus stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, our greatest opportunity to be like Jesus 
is when we have been hurt. Like, if you really want to be like Jesus this weekend, if you've been hurt, perfect opportunity. But here's the deal. Jesus said a lot of things. He said a lot of things in Scripture that I wake up some days and I go, Jesus, I don't feel like doing that today. I mean, I'll just, just give you like a little, little, little portion. Like, he says in Luke 6, verse 27, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. I don't like doing that. That's hard. Do good to those who hate you. Jesus, they hate me for a reason. I don't really, this doesn't make, bless those who curse you. You ain't gonna cuss me out and get a blessing. Come on, what are we doing? But then, Jesus gets wild. He says, pray for those who hurt you. Pray for those who hurt you. Jesus, I barely pray for people I like, let alone people I don't like. What, you want me to add them to this list? No, 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 no. I'm not adding these people to my prayer list. That's not happening. But, once again, I think Jesus is brilliant. There's no leader in human history that has ever talked like this. Praying for the people who hurt you and cheated on you and broke your heart and fired you and ghosted you is a great plan. Because what has holding bitterness against them done for you or them lately? Like it's just not a great plan. Now let's just... Let's just play this out for a minute, okay? You're going to pray for somebody that has hurt you. If you do that, if you're honest, it's probably going to be what I like to call a petty prayer, especially if it's your ex. Lord, help him to move out of his mama's house right now, God. We just thank you for that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That was, that was, that was mean, okay? You didn't have to tell God to slip that in. Lord, help him get a real job. Come on now. Let's not, let's not, let's not knock Uber today, okay? That's serious, okay? Lord, help my boss with her bad attitude. She needs you bad. Like, you, you are doing petty prayers. Lord, help my neighbor move to a new house in Canada. I want it to be colder for them wherever. Like, come on. That's a petty prayer. That's how it starts. But here's what I've learned. It's hard to hold bitterness against someone you're continually really praying for. The prayers might start off petty, but eventually, the longer you pray, the more you're going to get God's heart for that person. Because then it moves to, Lord, could it be that there's something going on with them that made them hurt me? God, would you heal the parts of them that hurt the most? Yeah. I'm with Jesus on this one. Pray for those who hurt you. Now, this last thing is something I really believe is going to help you deal with bitterness. It's number three. It's decide to forgive people before they hurt you. Not after. This is a big deal because most of us are waiting until the crime is committed before we decide how we're going to respond to it. Make the decision early. If you wait for the crime to be committed, it's too late for you to be the person you actually want to be. Make up your mind. You know what? I'm, I'm going to forgive people before they hurt me. Do what the Apostle Paul talked about it to the church in Colossae. He says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Make allowance. Leave a little bit of margin in your heart and mind for other people's faults. This means you and I are living with a little bit of grace in our back pocket at all times for all people. I think what makes us so upset and so disappointed and so bitter is that we expected people to be and do better. Now, here's the deal. I don't think low of other people in my world, but what I do now is I simply anticipate that the people in my life are going to make some mistakes this week. The reason I assume that everyone around me is going to make mistakes in my world is because I'm in the group. And so that means I'm going to make some mistakes. So here's what I suggest you do. Anticipate that your friends and your colleagues and your family members are going to do something that upsets you 
over the holiday season. Stop letting people catch you off guard. You should go to work this week looking for somebody to make a mistake. On Monday, is it you? You going to act a fool today? Is it you? Okay, it's not you. Okay, Tuesday, is it you? Okay, it's Wednesday, not you today. Okay, third, bam, there it is. I've been waiting for you all week. With a little bit of grace in my pocket, you're not catching me off guard. I'm walking around with grace and praying that somebody is doing the same thing for me. I think a lot of us have found ourselves bitter because we gave people in our world zero margin for error. And that's impossible to live with, work with, date, or be married to. My best friend, he called me a couple years into my wife and I first being married. He said, hey, man, how, how, how are things with you guys? I said, man, I, if I'm going to be honest, things aren't well right now, man. He said, what's going on? I said, man, listen, I don't want to talk bad about my wife. But, man, she keeps doing something that just drives me crazy, and I'm just not sure if we're going to make it, man. I, the things are just, it, it's driving me crazy. I'm losing. He said, well, what's she doing? I said, man, listen, I, I don't really want to get into all the details right now, but essentially what my wife has been doing ever since we got married is she keeps moving my cell phone chargers. Listen, there's not that many devices in our home to charge. We have three times as many chargers as we do devices. I just don't understand how and why these chargers keep moving. The cell phone charger in my designated vehicle should remain in my designated vehicle. You have a charger in your car. I don't understand what would cause a person to break into their spouse's car to steal their charger. The charger on my side of the bed is designated for my devices. What made me more upset? is when I opened an investigation as to the disappearance of said cell phone chargers, my wife responded, I don't know what happened to them. We had one child at the time who was only two, so our options were, were her, the baby, or the Holy Spirit. It was you, okay? And I was so mad, and my best friend, he just goes, hey, Ryan, why don't you just buy more cell phone chargers? I said, that's why I don't like you or her right now. I then asked him, I said, man, how, 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 are, how, are, you, how are you and Angie doing, man? How are, how are you guys doing? He said, man, whew, we're hitting a little bit of a rough patch. I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, she's mad at me. I said, well, what'd you do? You clearly did something. He said, well, we were talking the other day, and she, she said, well, I, I, I just don't understand how you have enough energy to go to the gym, but you don't have enough energy to change the windshield wipers on our car. Hey, man, I'm with her on this one, bro. I just, I don't know what to tell you. Like this, that, that's a good, this is a good, good point. And, and at one point in the conversation, I said, hey, did you ever think five years ago before either of us were married that we'd be in our garages whispering underneath our vehicles so our wives could hear she crazy? I know she crazy. And like, and that the subject of the tension in our marriage would be cell phone chargers and windshield wipers. It's like never in a million years. But ladies and gentlemen, it always starts small. And before you know it, it, it snowballs into something big. And before you know it, you got bitterness. And your red flag starts showing. Here's what I've learned. Letting go of the small stuff gives us practice for letting go. Of the big stuff. And I know some of us have much, much bigger issues to work through because they lied, because they stole, because they cheated, because they left. And I just, I wish forgiveness was easy, but it's a journey, right? Can I encourage you this week? You can't change what happened in the past, but you can change what happens in your future. This Christmas season, I have to encourage you to forgive the people in your life that hurt you. 
Forgiveness doesn't always mean reconciliation. Forgiveness doesn't always mean you have to trust them again. Forgiveness doesn't mean you have to forget. It just means you're no longer holding them responsible for making it right. I mean, what would it look like for us to let them off the hook and go to God for our healing? Sometimes you and I have forgiveness prerequisites. We'll forgive them when, when what? When they apologize, when they pay you back, when they take ownership of their part. Here's the deal. I just don't like that plan for you or for me because we could be waiting in that line for a very, very long time. And I would just think, however you think you'd live, believe, or behave, once they jump through those hoops, why wait for them to do all of that to become the person you want to be right here and right now? So I want to end with two questions. Number one, who do you need to forgive? Who's the person? Who's the group? Remember, I, I don't think that you should forgive them because they deserve it. I think you should forgive them because you didn't deserve it. So yeah, this holiday season, I'm just going to encourage you to Forgive your dad. Forgive your mom, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your in-laws, your doctors. Forgive the teacher. Forgive the friend. Forgive the pastor. Do the hard thing now that helps you become who you want to be in the future. Secondly, got to ask, is there anybody you need to ask for forgiveness from? I know that may be tough, especially when we start playing the blame game. It was 90% their fault and only 10% ours. So. But just imagine what would happen in your life if you apologize for your 10%. I've got a feeling that some of us need to have some tough conversations before Christmas. Perhaps today you need to make a tough phone call, send a tough text message, or write a tough email. I just realized that forgiveness isn't a magic pill that we all can take in a day. But what I do believe that we can do in a day is decide that we don't want to be bitter. To actually make a decision that we actually want to forgive. For some of us, the next step in our life of getting rid of this red flag is just making a decision today that says, you know what, I, I'm not saying I'm going to, I'm not saying it's going to happen today, but you I want to forgive them. I feel like they destroyed my life. I feel like they destroyed our family and it feels unforgivable. But today I'm just going to say out loud, Lord, I, I want to forgive them. And that's a decision that I think that you and I should make, especially in light of what Jesus came to the planet to do for you and for me. So, who do you need to forgive? And who do you, perhaps, need to ask for forgiveness from? Lord, I thank you so much for Eagle Brook Church. God, I pray that we would search our hearts and search our minds. And if there's anybody in our life that we need to let off the hook. God, I pray that you would give us the strength to do so. Lord, would you help us be the kind of people that walk around with a little bit of margin for error and a little bit of grace in our back pockets at all times for other people's faults. And God, I pray that somebody else would be doing the same thing for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got some awesome Christmas services 
that will begin on Thursday going up to Christmas Eve. And uh, we've got a prayer team down here if there's anything we can be praying about with you and your life. Have a wonderful Christmas holiday.